Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. As always, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by my wonderful friends and your wonderful friends at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. As you're hearing this episode, I'm about to jet off to New Zealand to participate in the ACES conference. I'm going to record lots of episodes of Knowing Animals there, so I'll be able to bring you the good news from um, animal studies in this part of the world very soon. But in order to engage with the organisation and support their good work, I encourage you to do a couple of things. One is go to their Facebook page, ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association, and click like. And also think about joining the organisation because memberships and subs is what helps the organisation run and what allows them to have these conferences. And it's very worthwhile. It's only 50 Australian dollars for those who are waged. So that's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Okay, let's get down to business. Now, this episode of Knowing Animals is being brought to you by my, brought to you from my lounge room. So it's a little bit coolish autumn day in Sydney, Australia, where I'm here on the lounge with a very good long-term colleague and friend of mine, Dr. John Hadley. Now, John has been on the podcast before, so he'll be well known to probably everyone who listens. John is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Western Sydney. And today we're going to discuss John's paper, From Welfare to Rights Without Changing the Subject. And this appeared in the journal Ethical Theory and Moral Practice in 2017. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Okay, John. So, why this paper? What's it all about? Well, I've been interested for a long time in how questions and debates in two philosophical subfields, metaphysics and epistemology, the implications of debates in those areas for animal ethics. So, metaphysics is the study of being or what there is in the world. And epistemology is the study of knowledge and how we come to acquire knowledge of the world, studies of argument and things like that. And most of the debates in those areas are passed over by people who write about animal ethics. Either they don't engage with them at all, or they presuppose that the questions are settled, when in fact they're not. Uh, Really important questions are still being debated, questions about moral truth, questions about value and things like that. So if we consider metaphysics first, so metaphysics is the study of being or what there is in the world. And there is an influential view in metaphysics known as scientific naturalism. And scientific naturalism is basically the idea that all that exists, or the only things that can exist, are the subject of scientific inquiry where science is understood in terms of physics, chemistry, biology, or behavioral psychology. So if you are a scientific naturalist, which is kind of the default or mainstream position in metaphysics, then that raises questions about value, for example. And there is an important problem in metaphysics called the placement problem. How do we place value in a scientific picture of the world? Now, as well as value, there's other contentious entities as well. Numbers, for example, uh, reasons, certain modality like necessity and contingency. Philosophers debate how we give account of these things in terms consistent with scientific naturalism. So immediately you get this problem for animal rights theory, the signature concept of which is inherent value. I'm here talking about Tom Regan's particular version of animal rights. <coughs> but it also applies generally, I think, just to the notion of something being valuable or important. So Tom Regan tells us that inherent value 
is somehow derived from psychological capacities, the subject of a life capacities, and yet the, con- the concept does not admit of degree. It's a categorical concept. You either have it or you don't. And for a lot of philosophers who are working in metaphysics, value is something that is not able to be located in a scientific picture of the world. So what kind of picture is it able to be located in? And the idea or the claim is that it doesn't fit in a scientific picture of the world, a naturalistic picture, but it may fit in what's called a supernaturalistic picture. And the supernaturalistic picture is a metaphysics associated with religion. So if you think about the idea of a human soul, you know, supposedly you get the soul from conception, uh, you either have one or you don't. You know, there's an analogy there between Regan's concept of inherent value and the subject of a soul. So, you know, it seems to me a interesting question to ask I- whether at the metaphysical level, underpinning animal rights, there is some kind of position that is not unlike a, a religious view. So that's one of the issues that I'm interested in and that is kind of working away in the background of that paper. Now another one is in epistemology and the philosophy of language. And here there is an important debate about moral truth. So if I was to make a claim such as the bottle is on the table, the orthodox view is that the sentence is representing the world. Each of the words in the sentence, bottle, table, on, is picking out or hooking up to something that is actually in the world. The term bottle picks out a bottle, the term table picks out a table, and the term on picks out a relation between the bottle and the table. So that is a view of language known as a representational theory of language. So immediately when we think about ethical sentences, we get this um, difficulty. Somebody says giving to charity is good. If we presuppose representationalism, then each of the terms needs to hook up to something. The term giving hooks up to an action, charity, some kind of organization. How does or how or what does goodness hook up to? Right? Now, from the, uh, in the background there or looming large in how we should understand language is the question of moral truth. Most people are prepared prepared to accept that claims about bottles on tables are straightforwardly true or false. But questions about ethics, or that include ethical terms, right, wrong, good and bad, etc., um, are not as straightforward. Right? So if we accept that kind of distinction, then perhaps the claims that are being made in the context of animal rights ought not to be seen as akin to a claim about bottles on tables. That is, we should see them as something different. Rather than describing the world, we should see them as doing some other kind of work. So that, so that alternative way of thinking about those claims, perhaps, is a way of thinking about language known as anti-representationalism. And here... The idea is that when someone makes a claim, such as confining hens in battery cages is wrong, they're not describing anything uh, when they use the term hen. They're not picking out the hen. When they use the term battery cage, they're not picking out the battery cage. When they use the term wrong, they're not picking out a property of confining a hen in a cage. Rather, they're just expressing their emotions. It's like they're just like reacting with disgust or they're just showing a negative attitude. Whatever they're doing, it's not capable of being true or false. So this way of thinking about what's happening when people make claims about animals and how they are treated, I think, (coughs) is a useful way of understanding and um, Uh, engaging in a debate about what goes on when people use two terms associated with animal rights, respect and dignity. So if you think about representationalism again, when somebody says, you know, um, using an animal as a studio guest 
treats it in an undignified way, if we interpret that in terms of representationalism, then dignity needs to be a property that is actually out there, independent of the speaker, somehow inhering in the act of taking an animal on a, into a television studio and using it as a guest. But if we interpret it simply as reacting in opposition to what is being done to the animal, then none of those problematic issues about the truth status of the claim or the metaphysical status of the claim uh, even arise. We can just see it straightforwardly as a case of somebody who opposes using as an animal as a studio guest and just um, expressing their disapproval. But of course, that then suggests that what's going on when people make claims about animals, they cannot help themselves to the concept of truth. They cannot think that they've got the correct view because their view is not describing anything that is out there in the world and that can be interpreted as correct in accordance with the standards by which we ordinarily judge claims as correct. Uh, so that's how I got interested in the issue and the two concepts uh, concerned in the paper are dignity and respect. And so what I'm worried about there is that if orthodox welfare thinking is representational and assumes that claims about welfare are once and for all claims, claims that are true or false, then when somebody comes along and says uh, you're treating an animal in an undignified way, they're actually not talking about welfare, they're changing the subject. They're talking about something else entirely. And so I think the expressivist view or the anti-representational view of language allows the person to avoid the charge of changing the subject because they're not in the business of making claims about the world at all that can be true or false. They're just expressing their emotions. So hopefully all of that <laughs> made sense. It's kind of a, uh, a technical issue, but it really comes down to what's going on, I guess, when people use certain terms that appear in animal rights literature. Interesting. Well, you've given us a lot to discuss and to dig into. John, hearing your explanation now and, of course, reading the paper, I'm wondering to myself, does the concept of dignity or the concepts of dignity and respect operate the same in regards to human animals in your view? So, for example, um, my poor old father's unwell, he's in a nursing home and there's this idea of, around if he's permitted to do certain things, then that will ensure his dignity and if he's not, then it will compromise it. And I'm just wondering whether that concept in relation to a vulnerable human does the same work. I mean, is it still open to interpretation as to what constitutes dignity in the human case? Okay, so here the distinction between the representational view and the anti-representational view is important. So if you are a representationalist, someone may say, look, historically the term dignity is restricted only to persons, you know, cognitively functioning uh, homo sapiens. So somebody who's using the term is misapplying it to animals. Right? But if you go expressivist, then there's no sense in which you can misapply the term because you're not um, ascribing a property to an animal. You're just expressing your own opposition or indeed support if you call something good or whatever. So the expressivist doesn't... Expressivism is not a species-sensitive theory. The idea is that the terms themselves, whether they're applied to humans or animals, are not truth-apt. They're not able to be rendered true or false in the same way that claims about bottles and tables are. So the same applies for your, in your father's case. If you say you're treating my father in an undignified way, you're not making a claim about an action, how, the, how your father is being treated and a property of that action. You're simply expressing your regret at how he's being treated or 
your disapproval of how he's being treated, etc. And that applies whether you're talking about an animal or a homo sapien. So what you're saying in that case, I mean, I would have thought that it was fairly uncontroversial to hold the view that, you know, people in a coma or, or babies or whatever can be treated with dignity or otherwise. And so you're trying to apply the same logic that we see operating in the human case in the animal case and you and you want to make the case that this is a legitimate way of adopting or using this concept. Yeah, so what I think, I think it's unproblematic if we accept expressivism to talk about treating somebody who's in a coma in an unproblematic, uh, sorry, treating a coma in a problematic way to say that it's undignified treatment. But if we were going to be representationalists, then it is deeply controversial whether you can treat somebody who's and in a coma. And there are some people that hold that view. Yeah, yeah, there, there would be some people right. to hold that view. But, you know, as, as I suggested at the start, they're invariably, I mean, this is an empirical claim I've got no evidence for, but I'm guessing they have some kind of religious metaphysics underpinning the view that kind of renders meaningful their use of the term dignity. Right. And... But if you don't avail yourself of that religious metaphysics, if you're a scientific naturalist, then the only way you can really allow them to continue to s use the term dignity is if you go with the expressivist view. Because otherwise it just looks like they're doing something very strange mm. indeed. So animal advocates you know, spend a lot of time arguing that the cage is too small because the bird can't stretch her wings or mm. the sow stall is too narrow because the, the pig can't turn around, she can't access her young, etc., etc. These traditionally are not arguments focused on respect. They're focused on, um, you know, foreclosing opportunity or pain, suffering, etc., do you want to expand out the conversation? Is there room for those conversations as well in what you're presenting? Uh, yeah, I think there is. So, so if you take the representational orthodoxy and somebody says confining hens in battery cages is bad for their welfare, right? So the question then is, well, okay, how should we understand the term welfare? When somebody talks about bad welfare, are they making a descriptive claim of what is going on or are they registering their opposition to what is being done to the hen, right? And then there's a question mark about welfare itself, whether it's the kind of concept that, like a scientific fact, can be pinned down once and for all or whether it is invariably a contested concept, right? Uh, if you go with the welfare orthodoxy, uh, say the welfare, the orthodoxy associated with science, you've got an ostensibly hedonistic view. The measure of welfare is feelings. So the the scientific, the physiological scientist will measure welfare by blood or heart rate, or you know, breathing. Um, stuff like that. The behavioral welfareist will look at stereotypical behavior or passivity or bruising, something like that. And then you've got the theoretical hedonist that will talk about the conscious experience of pain or whatever. But basically, you've got everybody in agreement. Okay. If we presuppose the kind of philosophical approach that scientific naturalism works under, then those claims about welfare are meant to be once and for all. The rival views about welfare are rival claims that aspire to be correct or true. And the whole debate kind of proceeds under the assumption that one side is right and the other side is wrong and we're trying to uh, get to the truth, as philosophers like to put it. An alternative view, I think, a more realistic view, is that particularly in liberal democracies, a concept like welfare is something that people will always disagree about, particularly given that uh, animals are so much a part of uh, 
you know, so bound up with our lives in liberal democracies. They're so much a part of the economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's always going to be uh, contestation about welfare. So does the idea that you can get once and for all answers about welfare and how animals should be treated, does that make sense? Uh, if you go with the orthodox kind of view, then um, one side or the other is seriously mistaken. I don't think it is a mistake to feel a certain way about welfare. I think it just reflects where the person has come from, what their interests are, you know, what kind of influences they've been exposed to, etc. That way of thinking about debate fits nicely, I think, with the expressivist view of language. That people are registering rival opinions and we should see debate not as correcting one's interlocutor, not as, you know, using our abstract reasoning to enlighten them, but you want to get them to your way of thinking. You want them to see things from your perspective. You want them to share your concerns. So you can do that in a variety of ways. You know, some people are going to like logical argument. Some people might like poetry or graphic imagery or whatever, right? But the idea is that, you know, um, there's an ongoing conversation here. The idea of correctness you know, or, or pinning down correct answers. Subjecting ourselves to a really strict methodological approach, an approach which sees philosophy as an extension of science, basically, is um, unhelpful and exposes people to the charge of changing the subject. And that, I think... Um, this is why I think expressivism allows us to move from welfare to rights, from a concern for how things feel to a concern about other stuff, dignity, respect, whatever, without being accused of changing the subject because you're doing something entirely different. Mm. So, John, it strikes me that the the notion or the expression changing the subject is probably something that's used quite regularly in philosophical debates but perhaps isn't in common usage you know in the community so I'm just wondering in your view thinking about what animal advocates for example might take away from this episode is your uh, approach in a sense opening up opportunity for more people to feel empowered to get involved in the animal welfare debate you know, you don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be trusting blood cortisones. You can have a legitimate view that you can argue for. That is that this is undignified or this is compromising or this is bad for reasons that you should feel empowered to express. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that is how, that is the positive side of expressivism. I mean, uh, it explains why there is disagreement. It explains why people are so passionate about certain things because they're expressing their emotions. They're expressing strongly held feelings when they see certain things. And so there is no sense in which you can accuse of being of misapplying the term. Now, I, sh I should say that there is a kind of middle position called quasi-realism. It's a view in uh, epistemology and metaphysics which kind of says that, look, a lot of the meta-level questions that I'm talking about, they can operate at one level, but in reality, it's actually useful for people to think they're making descriptive claims. That when someone says, you know, it's undignified to treat an animal like that, there is a fact of the matter, and they are making a quasi-descriptive claim. And it's better that we just let that play out. I mean, I think, I'm, I guess I'm agnostic about whether I think, you know, we should be expressivism on both levels, but I think, you know, as a philosopher, it's interesting to see the implications of particular theories and to link certain kinds of disciplines and sub-disciplines together. And, and that's what I'm doing in the paper. It's 
primarily a theoretical exercise. But yeah, I can see that, you know, I'm not, I'm not enjoining people to hold their, be careful about what they say because expressivism doesn't allow for error. All the only basis you can really criticize somebody is if in some context relevantly similar, they don't express the same kind of term and therefore their emotions. So you can accuse people of having inconsistent desires, but you can't accuse them of getting the world wrong or being incorrect or um, making some kind of factual error. Mm. And that notion of inconsistency is important to us because speciesism is one of the foundation stones upon which, you Mm. know, poor treatment of animals is built, right? Mm. Yeah. But, you know, I guess like like a scientist, uh, you know, needs to be, to identify with the project of science, they need to be sensitive to the norms of science and therefore you know, um, resist any inclinations to commit scientific fraud and to go with the evidence and to be open-minded about their inquiry, etc., etc. They need to care. Similarly, under the expressivist idea, if people don't care about being inconsistent, if they don't, if they're not worried that their desires don't align in relevantly similar contexts, then there's really nothing that you can do. Well, it's the same with rational argument. There's a limit to to what people will will be receptive to. Well, John, with that in mind, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer quick questions. Now, you're a return guest, so in your case, it's four quick questions. Are you ready for your four quick questions? Sure, yep. What's been the most satisfying or rewarding aspect of uh, doing animal studies research? I think uh, on those very rare occasions when, and they're exceedingly rare, when you get invited to speak to ordinary people uh, because people who invariably have pets or they're, they're consuming animals, they're interested in the topic. So you get this kind of receptivity to your subject matter that I think a lot of other academics may not get. If you say, if you're an economist or, or, you know, if I was a pure metaphysician, people may kind of not be willing to receive what I do as readily. So that's good. You, you tend to get positive uh, engagement, not necessarily supportive, but you, you get a receptive audience on, at those times. Wonderful. So what's been the most challenging or disheartening mm. aspect? So Perhaps a longer list. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, as listeners can probably guess now, um, you know, I do, I'm a philosopher, I'm an analytic philosopher, and there are very, there's not that many an- analytic philosophers in what we might call animal studies. Animal studies tends to be... Uh, or most people engaging in animal studies come from disciplines very different to analytic philosophy, so sociology or anthropology or maybe continental philosophy or uh, gender studies or, or whatever. And the disciplinary norms associated with argumentation and making claims and defending claims um, aren't really operative or aren't operative in the same kind of way as they are in analytic philosophy. So I guess I feel a little um, isolated maybe in the animal studies realm. Uh, But not only, you know, not only that, I think there is in some circles downright hostility towards some of the assumptions of analytic philosophy within certain areas of animal studies. And so that kind of, I guess, you know, maybe maybe that's something that is just about me. Um, but, you know, I, sc- I kind of feel like, yeah, um, analytic philosophy is kind of a bit of an outlier um, area in, in animal studies. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, you know, not 
so many guests so far have answered the four quick questions, but many will in the future. So I'll be interested to hear if other people have that feeling because I often feel as though politics is an outlier in the field. <laughs> so yeah. maybe we're all outliers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, John, this is your opportunity to give a shout out to an animal studies scholar who you would like to make the audience aware of. It, it could be an emerging scholar. It could be someone who... Um, you feel hasn't received the attention that you think they deserve? Um, could be someone writing in a language other than English. Who would you like to shout out? So I would like to uh, mention Bob Fisher. So Bob is a philosopher at Texas State University. And he doesn't kind of appear in uh, animal studies circles all that much, but he's active in animal ethics in North America. And I think he's an interesting theorist because he's pro-animal, but he likes to challenge some of the kind of more doctrinaire or perhaps dogmatic even um, elements of animal rights and and veganism theory. And so he's r- he's written a number of quite provocative papers. Uh, he's got one, Bugging the Strict Vegan, in which he argues that if you're vegan, you should actually be eating insects because raising and killing insects for food would require, f- um, would involve far fewer small animal deaths than the production of plant-based protein. And he has this other um, interesting paper, Facsimiles of Flesh, where he argues that it is actually speciesist on the part of um animal rights proponents to advocate and wear fake leather. And the reason he argues this is is via a thought experiment. And the thought experiment, which kind of typifies Bob's methodology, involves a detective coming across a murder scene in which a serial killer has made a lampshade out of human skin. And this detective is really struck by the beauty of this lampshade. And he's so struck by the beauty of the lampshade that he has a fake um, lampshade made, right, to resemble as closely as possible this lampshade made of human skin. And Bob argues we would obviously find that problematic, you know, call it wrong if you like, so what's the difference between a fake human skin lampshade and a fake leather belt, say? Right. So if you object to one, you must object to the other. Now, I warn uh, listeners, he's an acquired taste. He's an analytic philosopher, so his papers kind of have a strong argumentative feel about it. But I think they're worth persisting because of their inventiveness and also their subject matter. Like he, he, he's done a lot to introduce insects and fish to animal ethics and he's explored areas of moral psychology as well that don't get um, addressed all that much. So, yeah, I, I would say uh, Bob Fisher. Wonderful. Great. Shout out to Bob Fisher. So, John, are you optimistic about the future of human non human animal relations? Uh, unfortunately, no, sadly. And I think th- this is going to be a common answer to this question. Uh, presumably, the, the, the more that the world's population grows, the more the human footprint will spread out over natural areas. This will lead to more habitat destruction. Uh, My last book was looking a lot at habitat destruction and there's very um, miserable news about uh, carnivores particularly and the survival of wild carnivores uh, into this century is is not looking good. Uh, We'll probably end up with most wild species in kind of zoo, zoo situations. The only wild areas that will be left will be those unsuitable to development unless something catastrophic happens. Uh, More and more people will take up consumption of animal products. 
biomedical research will increase. It's not looking good, unfortunately. Oh, no. So, Lord of the Fries f- hasn't um, <laughs> placated you? No. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to be optimistic. Mm. Maybe if I thought about it, I could find one area, perhaps. But it's just very hard. I mean, even when you, you hear the good news like some recognition of something, say a recognition of sentience in some wording of some constitution or piece of legislation, Um, you kind of ask yourself, would would it have got up if it was going to make a meaningful difference? Mm. And it's hard to to imagine... uh, Things being very different to they are now, but hey, maybe that's me. Maybe I'm just. Should, we, should we give up and just join? The, you know, if we can't beat them, join them. <sighs> well, I think that's an individual question. I mean, you know, it goes back to some of the issues that are important in under in the case for expressivism is what motivates people to act at all, and you know, one of the, I guess realizations that you've got to make if you think that there is no place for truth in ethics is that the beliefs that we hold are contingent. They're not legislated by a standard outside of our own practices, by God or by some kind of abstract version of getting the world right, which kind of science works under. So if everything is contingent and a product of our own upbringings or whatever, then maybe people are better off um, in terms of their own prudential well-being, giving up. Maybe they would be happier. Uh, There's no uh, obligation. You can't force people to do it. They're either going to see it as part of a meaningful life for them or they're not. Um, And some people... It'll be, they'll come to animal ethics, animal advocacy at the right time. Other people will burn out very quickly. For some people, it'll be a lifelong thing. There's no guarantees. Well, I can announce on this show right now that I've thought about it and I've decided not to give up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soldier on. John, what are you working on next? So I'm actually writing a book-length treatment of the, the paper that, is the focus of today's podcast. Uh, that's hopefully coming out at the en- uh, before the end of this year. It's 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 kind of putting that expressivist view of language front and center, and the problem that I talked about at the start, the placement problem, looms large in it. And it's kind of it's going to be called animal neo pragmatism, from welfare to rights. And neo-pragmatism is a version of the philosophical theory of pragmatism. It's a, it, it, I guess it's distinctive because of its emphasis on language and how ideas about how people use terms ought to shape how we understand a bigger context. So that's the topic of the book and that's... Um, Hopefully, going to be out at the end of this before the end of this year. Mm, good. Well, wonderful. We can get you back on next year to talk about the book and to answer three quick questions. But how can people find out more about your work? So, um, I've got an Academia Edu page, or I've got a, um, a web page at Western Sydney University. Uh, they can find my stuff there, or send me an email, and I'll send them copies of. My papers, if they like, of course, pre-publication. Uh, yeah. Things Wonderful. Like John, thank you so much for joining us for Knowing Animals. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now we've got a new sound engineer at Knowing Animals, Oliver Lazarus. He's an audio producer and animal study scholars at NYU. So thanks so much, Oliver. 
And don't forget to follow Knowing Animals on the socials. We're all over it. We're at Knowing underscore Animals on Twitter and I'm at SO underscore S. There's also a Knowing Animals Facebook page and a Knowing Animals Instagram feed. Finally, most importantly, don't forget to review us on iTunes. Reviews for the podcast make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals.